Hello again, in this video I will be describing the tools of Lethal Company, plus a newly added creature and corrections to the last guide. Some changes from the version 40 update will be mixed in as I go through the video but will not have their own section. The last guide was really well received and the comments were a great source of information for everyone who read them, myself included, to learn new interesting things about the game. I'd like if the comments here could do the same, so if you feel anything was wrong or missing in this video, or have a question about the game, please write what you have to say in the comments. Once again, like the monster guide video I put out, this video contains spoilers regarding what I said it will contain, and I would personally recommend that you find out what these things do by playing the game if possible, as the learning experience is rewarding and allows you to figure out things that I may have missed in this video. With all that being said, now is your chance to skip the video if you do not want to get spoiled. For the purposes of this guide, tools will be all things the player can use to their advantage in a game, not just handheld items. This includes all non-cosmetic items that can be purchased from the terminal, ship upgrades, and the ship's built-in utilities. Items you can find in complexes and make some use of will be mixed in, but don't expect too much to be said as there are too many with very niche or no real use to be gone over in one video. Said tools will be split up into different categories, starting with battery-powered tools, then long-lasting tools, followed by disposable tools, and ending with ship-locked utilities. If you're not interested in the tools, feel free to skip ahead, as following the tools section, which will be the bulk of this video, I'll go over the new creature added in version 40 of the game before ending the video by highlighting some good comments about what I got wrong or missed in the last guide. A couple relevant notes for all handheld tools before starting are that they can be discounted by up to 90% of their original price. An example of this is a walkie-talkie having a 50% discount, so instead of costing $12, it'll only cost 6 These sales tend to change once a new quota period starts, and will never affect ship upgrades or cosmetics at the moment. Another note being that no tools purchased at the terminal currently generate a static charge. Therefore, if you're only carrying tools that you bought, Lightning will not target you, but it may hit you by chance. If you're holding other items alongside purchased tools, these other items can cause Lightning to strike you. And finally, the variables of the items in this list are likely to change quite often. Once again, I hope you enjoy this video. Tools found in this category have the defining characteristic of having a battery life, which is denoted by a yellow meter appearing in the top left of your screen when you're using them. Using one of these tools will deplete its battery life at a set rate that varies on a tool-by-tool -tool basis. All of these tools can have their battery recharged by holding them and interacting with the coil inside your ship. The walkie-talkie is the first item listed in the terminal and the first of this section. At the moment, it only costs $12, making it the cheapest item you can purchase without a sale. This affordability is due to the fact that at least two are required at one time to make any real use of them. This is because the walkie-talkie is a tool for communication, so if only one player is using it, they won't be talking to or hearing from anyone. A walkie does not weigh anything, so it won't hinder your mobility. Hello? A walkie can be powered on with the Q key, and after this, holding down the left mouse button will input your voice and nearby sounds through it. Any other players with the walkie powered on will hear your inputted noises through theirs. A walkie has an exceptionally long battery life of 13 minutes and 40 seconds. This duration will not change if you speak through the walkie or are spoken to, leading to it often having no reason to be charged during a day, as a day lasts at most under 12 minutes, making it no issue to keep it on all day from a full charge. A notable attribute about this item is that it does not need to be in your hand to hear people talking through it. You only need to have it in your hand if you want to talk to people. Everybody on a crew can talk through a walkie-talkie, but there's only one channel, so voices will overlap one another and make it difficult to understand others if there is too much commotion, so sometimes it is better to have fewer players using them that can relay information to others that are not using them, allowing for more free inventory slots across the crew and less confusion. This tool allows for complex strategies to become possible, such as having someone man the ship and effectively communicate with players in the complex to aid them. In general, coordinating actions and warning crew members becomes much easier with a walkie, so really, there are almost infinite use cases with this item. Something important to mention is that if you are standing next to someone who is holding a walkie and they are being talked to through it, you will not hear the person on the other end. In other words, only the person holding the walkie will hear what is being said on the other end. A personal note I have for this item is that if you want to use it, I would only recommend using two at a time as a crew, as this is usually enough to make good use of them. Another thing is that even though they are useful, they certainly aren't required even if someone is staying on the ship as you'll be close to other crew members or be able to reach them and talk to them normally many times throughout a day to relay information. In general, you can almost always get by fine without walkies being a part of your tool belt. Flashlights are the only handheld item at the moment to have variants. These would be the flashlight and the pro flashlight. These items on their own don't have a whole lot to be said about them. The flashlight costs $15, does not weigh anything, emits a dim cone of light where you look, and has a relatively short battery life of 2 minutes and 20 seconds. The pro costs $25, weighs 5 pounds, emits a bright and far-reaching cone of light where you look, and has a comparatively long battery life of 5 minutes. I personally consider flashlights to be the only item you should always carry when possible, as the light they provide makes many aspects of the game more manageable, although making loot runs back to the ship or manning the ship doesn't really require them. With this, the question isn't when you should bring a flashlight, but which one should you choose? On industrial complexes, I believe it comes down to a matter of preference. Do you prefer moving faster and don't mind flicking your light off every few seconds? 
or do you prefer seeing things and don't mind the minute mobility hit? On these moons, I generally prefer having a cheap flashlight so I can remain as mobile as possible. On mansion complex moons, I think the pro is stronger, as the map generation tends to create large expansive rooms and deep hallways that are difficult to navigate or notice things of importance in them without a light that can effectively illuminate them. The boombox is another battery powered item that has a lengthy battery life, with it being just under 6 minutes at 5 minutes and 49 seconds to be exact. It costs $60, which is a bit on the high end of things, and weighs 16 pounds. Turning the boombox on will get it to start playing a random song from a pool, and said song will loop until the boombox dies or is turned off. You will know a boombox is about to die when whatever song it is playing slows down and goes off tempo. Uses for the boombox are rather limited. It does provide morale to a team, with it playing upbeat tunes that will drown out the unsettling ambient noises or dreadful silence found in complexes. More practical uses include it being able to lure eyeless dogs, but as I stated in my monster guide video, this is a risky ordeal. The boombox can also pacify high deers, causing them to remain still while the music is present. Although, this effect feels inconsistent, and I had people comment on the last guide that it had the opposite effect. Personally, I find the boombox to be an item I only buy for fun when money is abundant, as the morale isn't worth an inventory slot with experienced players, and the practical uses are too niche. Currently, the zapgun is the only offensive rechargeable tool. The zapgun weighs 11 pounds and can be purchased for $400, making it a rather pricey gadget to consider using. When you activate the zap gun, it will send out some scanning rays ahead of you. If these rays detect something living, this being a creature or a fellow crewmate, it will cause the zap gun to lock onto whatever it detected. If nothing is detected, no battery life will be consumed and nothing will happen. Once the zap gun is locked on, it will send out an arc of electricity and lose battery life until you click again to deactivate it. When a being is being affected by the zap gun's arc, it will slow down greatly and have trouble doing very much. This allows for it to be used in different ways, such as keeping an enemy still for a crewmate to wail on it, or get a good stun grenade off. It can also buy time for other crew members so they can escape a threat. I've not done a whole lot of practical experimentation with it, so I would really like to hear how you make use of it. After zapping something, the zap gun will go on cooldown, which is denoted by it steaming profusely. It cannot be used during this period, which lasts 5 seconds, after which it will stop steaming and become usable again. It should be noted that the zap gun is quite buggy. It is in a much better place than it was prior to version 40, but still not without issues. Combined with its price, it is not something I often consider bringing into a complex. I believe the most effective way to use it at the moment is in conjunction with the player that has a shovel, as previously stated, as it doesn't make aggressively dealing with enemies much safer, especially hoarding bugs so you don't lose small bits of health over time. A new use for the zap gun that some of you let me know about, since the version 40 update, is that it can now force giants to drop players they are about to eat when they are zapped by it. The jetpack is the last battery powered item to talk about. It is the heaviest purchasable item at 52 pounds, and the most expensive non-cosmetic item to purchase, with a whopping base price of $700. When held, the jetpack can be activated by holding down the left mouse button to begin accelerating, and after a short period of time you will lift off the ground. Jumping while lifting off will give you an upward momentum boost and send you quite high into the air, so you can get a head start, but be careful if there is a ceiling. The main purpose of the jetpack is to get you around the outdoor map quickly. When flying with any amount of material carried, your speed will be much greater than it would be while running. The jetpack is a great tool for making many fast trips to a complex's entrance to carry only small items back to the ship, as the jetpack needs to be in your hand while using it, so you cannot carry items that fill your hands and fly around. When flying, if no other keys are pressed, you will rise straight up, but if you use WASD, you will rotate in a key-specific direction. W rotates you forwards, S backwards, A to the left, and D to the right. You can also move your mouse to look around and rotate depending on where you are looking. An example of this is that looking up will result in you rotating backwards. If a player crashes at a high enough speed while using the jetpack, or uses it continuously for too long, the jetpack will explode, killing the user and any nearby crewmates instantly. While in use, there will be a steadily intensifying jet sound, and at a certain point, the jetpack will explode. The time this takes does vary slightly. I found that it takes around 8 seconds to blow up after continuous use from a jump, and closer to 9 seconds from a non-jumping takeoff. So if the variation does exist, when you explode may depend on how far you travel, as the jumping boost allows you to travel the same distance faster when compared to a jumpless start. If a jetpack blows up, it can still be retrieved, but in this state it cannot be used in any meaningful way, as it will just emit a short hiss and not allow you to lift off while trying to use it. So long as a jetpack has not blown up, it can still be recharged and reused. It is very good to know that if you stop accelerating in the air and start again, it will reset the timer to as if you began accelerating from the ground without a jump, so you will have around 9 more seconds of flight before blowing up. This is what allows you to fly great distances across the map without consequence. With all of this, I would recommend trying not to use it for longer than 7 seconds at a time before resetting the timer by letting go of left mouse button and clicking it again, as the risk of losing a piece of equipment as expensive and as effective as the jetpack can be detrimental. It is very important to recharge your jetpack regularly, 
Even though it won't blow up when running out of battery, it is a heavy item that will have to be carried back to the ship to make it usable again, which can use up your valuable time. If you really aren't paying attention, you may even run out of battery midair. So if you're high enough, it can result in you taking unnecessary fall damage. In general, I recommend flying a jetpack to the main entrance and dropping it. Then when you have some small items to carry, preferably three, pick the jetpack up, fly back to the ship to drop them off, and recharge the jetpack. You can repeat this process as many times as you deem necessary throughout the day. Some unconventional uses for the jetpack are Outdoor enemies can be evaded quite easily while using the jetpack due to the high mobility it provides, but it makes noise, so if you land near eyeless dogs, don't be too surprised if they rush you. Normally some fire exits are unreachable from the outside, namely on offense and dine, as they are positioned on steep slopes, but with the jetpack you are able to reach them. If you start flying soon enough, the ship can be reached after it is taken off with the use of the jetpack, allowing you to make some last second clutch escapes with it. A final note is that the jetpack is usable indoors, but with the complexes being so cramped usually, its use there is negligible. The second category of this video addresses items I am deeming long-lasting tools. These tools have no need to be recharged and won't become unusable so long as you don't leave them behind. Basically these items can be used as many times as you like. The shovel starts off this category. It is a $30 item that weighs 19 pounds, causing it to significantly impact your movement. The shovel is your bread and butter for playing aggressively, as this item allows you to directly deal damage to enemies. This is done by swinging the shovel with a click of the left mouse button. After clicking, a short wind-up animation plays before you swing the shovel and hit something in front of you, so long as it is close enough. This short wind-up can make it difficult to land precise blows sometimes. If you often find that this is the case, you can ready a swing by holding down the left mouse button. When you release it, you will swing the shovel right away. It is good to know that holding a swing does not increase the attack's power. It is also good to know that different creatures take different amounts of blows to kill. Some are even invulnerable, and crewmates can also be killed. This guide is quite lengthy already, and its main purpose is not to tell you how to kill enemies, so it won't provide exact amounts of hits it takes to kill enemies. Instead, I have provided a short list that displays general amounts of swings it takes to kill said enemies. The shovel can also be used to clear spider webs by hitting the webs with it. This is not a huge deal as spider webs rarely completely block areas, and they can often be crouched under or jumped over. The stop sign and yield sign can be found within complexes. They function the exact same as a shovel except they weigh more, can be sold, and can cause lightning to target you. The stop sign weighs slightly more at 21 pounds, and the yield sign weighs significantly more at 42 pounds, so I would only consider it a substitute for the shovel before you bring it to the ship, as the mobility penalty its weight brings is too great relative to its use. Next up is the lock picker. This item costs $20 and weighs 16 pounds. It is a pretty basic item with it being able to unlock locked doors when you place it on them. This process takes 30 seconds. The lock picker can be taken off the door at any time during this and used elsewhere. If the lock picker is allowed to finish unlocking a door, it will simply drop off it to the floor so it can be picked up again and reused. An off case that makes it so I always consider having one in the ship is that they, just like all other purchasable tools, do not attract lightning during the stormy condition, whereas keys do. So in this case, I find they are superior to keys for allowing me to have peace of mind in the storm. Following that is the extension ladder, which costs $60 and does not have a weight. The ladder can be picked up in its box, and if it is dropped by clicking the left mouse button, it will extend upwards after a short delay, before falling towards the direction you were facing when you dropped it. It will fall in this direction until it hits an object, at which point it will stop moving for some time and can be climbed or walked on if it isn't too steep. It should be mentioned that the ladder will crush a player if it lands on them, so exert caution around it before it is still. 15 seconds after dropping the ladder, it will begin beeping. This is your warning that it will retract after an additional 5 seconds. When the ladder retracts, it will go back to being in its box state, to be picked up and dropped again to restart the cycle. The ladder can be picked up at any point when it is extended by pressing E on the box. This will instantly retract the ladder. This tool's use varies greatly depending on how knowledgeable you are about the moons you are visiting. My friend Liam is planning to create a guide on the moons of this game, so when that comes out, it will be a great guide for using the ladder well, and in its own regard. The reason for this is that this tool allows you to create paths that are not normally possible. This means that shortcuts around moons can be created. A basic example is that normally on experimentation, you have to walk to the left or the right of the wall to climb a world spawn ladder, then walk back towards the center to reach the entrance. With an extension ladder, you can simply prop up a temporary ladder in the middle, which saves you a couple seconds on your way to the main entrance. Many other shortcuts are possible, and as I stated before, some fire exits can't be reached from the outside normally. The ladder allows them to be reached just like the jetpack, but some differences here are that many people can use one ladder, whereas only one person can use the jetpack at a time, and the ladder is over 10 times cheaper than the jetpack normally is. Finally, the ladder can be used indoors. You might find some success doing so in larger rooms, but they are typically easy enough to traverse. The majority of indoor areas are too cramped to use the ladder effectively in, as if it hits a ceiling while falling, it will get stuck in the ceiling and that is likely not where you want it to land. The Radar Booster is a new tool added in version 40 of the game that costs $50 and weighs 19 pounds. 
Whenever you buy a booster, it will be given a random name, such as Gilbert. When held, the radar booster can be turned on and off by clicking the left mouse button. Having the booster on will allow it to emit a somewhat bright light and be viewed on the monitor system in the ship, just as a player would, with the booster's unique name being displayed as well. Multiple boosters can be on at one time, allowing you to place many inside and outside on a moon. There does not seem to be a limit, as the names will be repeated with a number put after them. For example, if two boosters are named no Louie, the second one will be named no Louie too. The booster's main purpose is to be placed at a desired point in the complex, so someone in the ship can monitor that area whenever they want. This can allow them to see trap and door codes as well as lurking enemies in that area all the time. An interesting function of the booster is that if the command ping booster name, for example ping Gilbert, hello? is typed into the terminal while the booster is powered on, it will emit a chime sound and a robotic hello. This can be used to lure sound-oriented enemies towards the booster, to keep players safe, and to help players navigate through a complex by leading them back to an area if they are listening and close enough. The light it emits also helps players find their way through a complex. All in all, if your crew tends to get lost in complexes easily, or someone is always staying in the ship, this can be a valuable item. Otherwise, their function is not of much use, so they are definitely something that can be skipped in a loadout. Disposable tools are the last category concerning handheld tools. These tools can only be used for a set amount of time, or amount of times, before they become junk. When they are used up, they can still be interacted with, but don't have much or any usefulness left in them, and they cannot be sold for money at the moment. Something I will quickly address is that jetpacks are a bit of a hybrid between this category and the battery-powered tools section I put them in, as they can become unusable when they explode, but for simplicity's sake I left them there. The stun grenade starts off this short category. It costs $40 and weighs 5 pounds. It can be used by clicking the left mouse button, which will pull the pin on the grenade. At this point you can click again to throw it a short distance, or do nothing. 3.3 seconds after you clicked, not after you pulled the pin but clicked, the grenade will detonate. When the grenade detonates, any players near it will be affected by getting blinded with their screen turning white, as well as being deafened after a loud bang with their ears ringing, they will also get slightly damaged. Enemies that are able to be stunned, and within the blast radius, will be stunned for a short duration, allowing you to escape them without pursuit. A detonated stun grenade will leave behind a spent case that can be picked up and thrown. I typically don't bring the stun grenade into a complex, as it requires practice to get the timing down, it is a bit pricey for a single use item, and you have to be close to an enemy to use it effectively, as you cannot throw it far, and the blast radius is not huge. Due to my lack of experience with it, I am probably unaware of many possible interactions with it. For example, I do not know if stunning a jester will reset or pause its song. A couple interactions I am aware of are the fact that force keepers lifting a player into their mouth will drop them if they are close enough to a stun's blast. Fake Kate Ghost commented the others in the last guide video. These beings throwing a used stun grenade's casing onto a landmine can allow you to blow it up from a distance, and the blast of a stun grenade will knock a snare flea off a player's head. The TZP inhalant is rounding off this category already. It costs $120 and does not weigh anything. The inhalant is used by holding down the left mouse button to inhale the tetrazenylpyrene within it. You are able to inhale for a total of about 21 seconds before the inhalant is completely consumed. The reason for using the inhalant is that depending on how long you inhaled for, the longer its positive effect will affect you. The effect is that your stamina consumption rate is significantly decreased, so you can run for much longer periods of time while under the inhalant's effects. Inhaling for around 10 seconds will give you the maximum effect duration of around 35 seconds. Inhaling more after this point will not extend the duration of the effect after you stop puffing. You can inhale as the effects wear off to extend it, but you can still run out of stamina while under the effects of the inhalant, so it is usually better to take a breather and get your stamina back before huffing again, so you can maximize its potential. Alongside the benefit are multiple side effects. The side effects will last as long as the benefit lasts, but will decrease in intensity as the effect wears off. The side effects include, but are not limited to, reduced visibility, visual distortions, audio distortions, reduced movement control, reduced camera control, and vocal abnormalities. These effects have increased severity depending on how long you inhaled for, reaching a peak when you have inhaled for 10 or more seconds at once. These side effects make it near impossible to navigate back to the ship, especially on dark snowy moons, unless you can already do it blind. Because of this, I recommend huffing the TZP for around 6 to 8 seconds, unless like I mentioned you can do the ship runs blind. If this is the case, go ahead, knock yourself out and get the full effect. Once you have inhaled all the TZP, interacting with the inhaler will just shake it, so nothing of use can be done with it. The inhalant effect is useful when you need to carry many heavy things back to the ship, including items that fill your hands, as unlike the jetpack, you don't have to carry the inhalant for it to affect you after using it. If there are no large items to carry, the jetpack is more efficient overall, but if money is tight you may only be able to afford the inhalant. Like any other handheld tool, the inhalant can be used indoors, and the only reason why I would think you would want to do this is to run further in any direction from threats, as the randomly generated complexes in my opinion are too hard to traverse accurately with the side effects. So if you just want to run away from something, you could consider using it indoors. The final category addressing tools in this video is dedicated to things you can actively use within the ship to aid your crew. 
defined here as ship lock utilities. As the name suggests, these tools are only ever present in the ship. Currently none of them are handheld, instead they are all appliances you can walk to and interact with. The first five tools found in this category are provided to you for free, and the last three are ship upgrades that you must purchase from the terminal to be able to use them in your ship. Starting off here we have the monitor. The monitor is locked at the end of the ship opposite of the entrance. It can be turned on or off with the red button found in its lower left corner. If lightning ever strikes the ship, the monitor and lights will turn off and need to be turned back on. The grey button just above the red one will change the display of the monitor, with it cycling through players and radar boosters in a set order. The monitor displays the map from a top-down view, with whichever player it is focused on in its center. The monitor will only ever display one plane of the map at a time, so if a player goes up or down a level, it will display whichever level they are on. It will also represent things of interest with a variety of symbols. It can get a bit confusing to read what a monitor is displaying at times, so I will go over what some of the symbols on it mean. A player is represented by a blue dot with a cone in front of them. The broad side of the cone indicates what direction they are facing. Deceased players are represented in the same way with the blue U's being a bit more dull or grey, and they won't be moving unless something is carrying them. Enemies are represented by red dots. These dots will vary in size relative to how large the enemy actually is, and move corresponding to the movement of the enemy. After a while you can identify what is around just by seeing the size and movement patterns of its dot. The yellow triangles you see around represent scrap. A triangle that is right on top of a player is scrap that they are carrying. Blue lines are doors. As far as I know there is nothing on the monitor that will indicate the difference between a locked door and an unlocked door. The more vibrant blue lines that are along solid walls represent main entrances and fire exits. The line representing the main entrance is longer than the one representing fire exits. Short red lines are vents that enemies can spawn from. Turrets are the red cones with a larger, more pale cone in front of them. The point of the small cone, or the rounded part of the larger cone, indicates where they are facing. Turrets, landmines, and mechanical doors will have green codes and green boxes on them. If the turret or landmine are temporarily disabled, a bar that shrinks over time will appear below the code to indicate the amount of time that they will remain inactive. Closed mechanical doors will have a code and a box that are both colored red. The terminal is next. This tool is built into the ship and can be moved around by pressing the B key on it. When you interact with the terminal, you are locked in place, and from then until you exit by pressing the escape or tab key, anything you type will be input into the terminal. This allows you to perform many tasks, such as viewing the moon list and their conditions before directing the ship to a moon by typing in its name, looking at bestiary or secret logs by typing in their names, browsing the shop and purchasing tools and cosmetics by typing in their names, and more. Something that is good to keep in mind is that you can buy multiple tools at once by putting a number after the tool's name when purchasing them. Also remember that a shipment can only contain a maximum of 10 items at a time. Terminal commands can sometimes be abbreviated to an extent. For example, if you wish to buy pro flashlights, you can simply type in pro and then how many you want, rather than typing in the whole name. Be careful though, there are some things that have similar enough names that if you abbreviate them, you may accidentally purchase an unwanted item. The terminal is where you can input codes so you can temporarily disable traps and open or close mechanical doors. A useful command for people who wish to monitor crewmates from the ship is view monitor. This will display the monitor on the terminal, allowing you to type in important things such as trap and door codes quickly without having to glance at the monitor or have someone else telling you the codes. The command switch can be used to cycle through players while viewing the monitor from the terminal. I won't go into more detail, as the terminal will explain itself if you use the help and other commands. The coil is another built-in ship utility. It doesn't really need to be explained here, as scanning it will tell you exactly what it does, but I will anyway because it is an important component of your ship if you use battery-powered items. This is because it is able to recharge the battery life of said items, allowing them to be reused more once they run out of juice. It can be used by one player at a time if they are holding a rechargeable item and press the E key to interact with it, resulting in the item they are holding to be fully charged. Using the coil will lock you in an animation, so be careful if active threats are entering your ship, because they can still damage you and you won't be able to move. The hydraulic door is found at the entrance to the ship, with its controls next to it on your right if you are facing the monitor at the other end. The door can be opened and closed with the buttons on this panel with the upper green one with a line on it opening the door, and the lower red one with a circle on it closing the door. Closing the door will make it so nothing can make it in or out of the ship, which is great for keeping dangers out, but can also lock you in or crewmates out with them. How long the door will remain closed until it is forced open is denoted by the percentage value on the control panel, which will begin to drop as soon as the door is sealed, not when the button is pressed. From 100%, it takes about 30 seconds for the door to open on its own. The percentage value will rise again when the door is open to any degree, from 0%, it takes around 6 seconds for it to reach 100%. You don't have to worry about closing the door on forest keepers, as they will only be able to grab you if you step outside the ship. The last free tool provided to your crew in your ship is the cupboard. I was debating whether or not to put the cupboard, shelf, cabinet, or whatever you want to call it on this list, as it doesn't really seem like a tool to me, but it is more than just furniture. This is because you can manually place items in it by holding the E key while holding the item you want to store. 
This allows you to organize items in a space-efficient area, allowing for quick and easy access to whatever you decide to put in there. Moving on to ship upgrades, the Loud Horn starts us off. It is currently the cheapest ship upgrade at only $150. The horn can be used by pulling its cord by holding the E key while looking at it. As you sound the horn, it'll ramp up for a bit and increase in volume. After a point, it'll be at its maximum volume. The deep bellowing sound it produces can be heard everywhere on the map, including inside complexes. This can allow for a form of non-verbal communication to be possible map-wide, as you and your crew can define certain horn patterns to mean different things. For example, you could say three short signals means force keepers are around, or one long signal means it's time to head back to the ship. The horn can also guide new players that have directional audio enabled back to the ship if they are lost, which happens quite often on the snowy moons for newer players. The loud horn will alert eyeless dogs, which can screw over the whole crew, so be conscious of the time and check for eyeless dogs somewhat regularly if you plan on using the horn lots. The teleporter is the second ship upgrade. It is priced at $375. When in the ship, it comes in two parts, the teleporter and its activation button. The teleporter can teleport one player to wherever the teleporter is placed in the ship. The player it teleports is whichever player the monitor is focusing on, so make sure you are teleporting the right person when it matters. To begin teleporting a player, press the E key while looking at the red button to the left of the landing switch on the desk to interact with it. This will lift the glass over the button. After this, E can be pressed again to click the button and start the teleportation sequence. After a short delay, the player will be teleported back to the ship. Another player cannot be teleported for 10 seconds after the button has been pressed. Dead players can also be teleported most of the time, allowing you to reduce the amount of money lost at the end of the day. I say most of the time because under certain circumstances bodies cannot be retrieved by the teleporter. These would be in cases such as the body was eaten whole by a forest keeper, the player sunk in mud, etc. When a player is teleported, they will drop all the items they are carrying wherever they were before arriving at the ship. So unless you are fine leaving your carried items behind, don't ask to be teleported. Something I became aware of thanks to many comments in the last guide is that players can be teleported out of a giant's hand to stop them from being eaten. For this to happen, the teleport sequence has to be started quickly, as the windup is too long and will result in the player being eaten if it is started too late. In general, the teleport is an effective way to get players out of an otherwise fatal situation and to recover the bodies of dead crewmates. Wrapping up this category, and the tool portion of this video, is the inverse teleporter. The inverse teleporter is the most expensive ship upgrade at the moment, with a price of $425. The inverse teleporter is activated almost exactly like the regular teleporter is, but instead a yellow button on the monitor desk is used. When it is pressed, the inverse teleporter will begin firing up for a short amount of time. Any players who are in the inverse teleporter by the end of this windup, at most the whole crew, will drop their carried items in the ship and be teleported to a random location within the complex. It is good to note that the inverse teleporter has a 200 second cooldown, so crew members cannot be readily teleported one after another. If multiple players are teleported, they are not guaranteed to arrive at the same location, as it is completely random where you end up inside a complex after using the inverse teleporter. The case is the same if a player goes in alone. The random indoor teleport factor can cause issues, as it is possible to end up in a hallway that is separated from the rest of the complex by a locked door. Because of all of this, I feel as if the inverse teleporter is a good tool for anyone willing to test their luck. I feel this way because a lucky teleport can result in a player being able to skip the trip to the complex and begin looting right away, or directly provide the crew inside with valuable information. But an unlucky teleport can result in a player becoming completely stuck unless another player is able to help them out. And that's that for the tools. Moving right on to the next part, I will be talking about the new enemy that was added in version 40 of the game. The enemy I'm talking about is the Baboon Hawk. These jumpy avine apes are a new addition to the list of outdoor enemies. They have a few notable gimmicks that define how they should be played around. To start, they will harass players by attacking them lightly so they will give up their carried items. If an item is dropped in front of them, they will pick it up and carry it some distance before dropping it. This process can be prevented if you're in a group with your crewmates, as the hawks are reluctant to attack those in larger groups on their own. That being said, they can group up in tight packs with the intent of outnumbering you. With this, their aggressiveness towards players increases depending on how much they outnumber you by, and will even attack you for no good reason if they have enough numbers. When you do ward them off with a numbers advantage, they will typically linger around you, so don't split up until you reach your destination. Even individual hawks are quite large and move quickly, so they are not hard to spot. If you do spot a large group, it is best to avoid running into them when possible. Despite all this, these enemies can help out a crew a bit with their aggressive nature. I believe if they are in a group of two or more, they will attack eyeless dogs they run into, distracting them from a crew they may have otherwise noticed. However, the dog will dash around while being attacked, so it may inadvertently run into a player and kill them. I don't believe they can spawn early in the day without an eclipse, but they do seem to spawn in earlier than the outdoor nocturnal enemies that were already in the game. I would say you should expect to see them in the early afternoon and onwards. As far as I know, they are able to spawn on all moons, but are most common on medium and hard moons. In short, if their presence is known, avoid traveling outdoors on your own, and try to avoid confronting them altogether, especially if they are in a large group. Before I close this video out, I would like to go over some of the notable corrections people commented on my monster guide, 
as well as information that was not included in that video, which commenters also provided. Some of the things I would go over here, I already mentioned earlier in this video when I thought it was appropriate, such as being able to be teleported out of a giant's hand, so I won't go over these things again. To start, by far the most common correction was related to what enemies appear on moons. It has become abundantly clear to me now that all enemies can appear on all moons. It's just that some are much more common than others on certain moons. For instance, I have still never seen a forest keeper on the first two moons, even after 60 hours of gameplay, but enough of you have told me otherwise to convince me that I was wrong. Another example of this is, the ghost girl and jester are enemies I said would only appear on hard moons, and again, very many people were able to point out that I was incorrect about this, with people recounting instances of encountering them on moons I said they would not appear on. Specifically, the girl seems to have encountered lots on easier moons. Because of all this, I would say it is safer for the time being to assume all enemies can be on all moons. Next are some useful tips that people let me know about. It is known that when a snare flea drops in your head, you drop all your items. What isn't commonly known is that you can pick them up again, and you can use them. So if you had a shovel, you can pick it up and swing it to hit the snare flea on your own head to knock it off. Cole Newwind is the person who let me know about this. Railings are a great way to avoid enemies that are stuck low to the ground, such as hygro deers, bunker spiders, and thumpers. The latter two can be killed easily from these elevated positions, as you're able to hit them with a shovel when you crouch above them, and they cannot hit you. The bunker spider may climb up a wall near you to reach you though. Flexchagalaga4477 expands upon this in their comment here. Another thing that I missed, that Mystical Sign mentioned, is that the girl can be avoided by running away from her, as she will disappear for a short time if you avoid her for long enough. This is pretty easy to do so long as there aren't many other enemies around, and you don't let yourself get cornered. The final thing to talk about is that quite a few people were confused about the hay sound that can be heard within the complexes. Because the hay sounds like it is being said by a girl, it is often thought that it is being said by the ghost. This is not true, as the hay is an ambient sound that can be pulled from a large pool of sounds that are played at random when inside a complex. Something that adds to the illusion of the girl saying this is that only one player at a time will hear an ambient sound. In other words, it is extremely unlikely for two players to hear an ambient sound at the same time, let alone the same one. This in conjunction with the girl being only visible to one player at a time leads to the seemingly reasonable conclusion that the girl is the source of the hay. But once again this is not true, as the two are not directly linked. This was something I was 99% sure about, but not absolutely certain, as I hadn't bothered to explicitly test it. But Reed7639 was willing to go into the game and figure out for sure that the two are not correlated, so a big thanks goes out to them. They also mentioned an interesting way of aggressively dealing with dogs, but I would say stealth is still probably your best bet around them. This was a long video. I was not expecting there to be more to say about the items in Lethal Company than its creatures, let alone this much more. With the sheer amount of topics covered, I'm certain I missed important things. So again, if you noticed anything was wrong or missing, please let me know in the comments, and I'll try to address it in the next video like this. Like I mentioned at the end of the last guide, Lethal Company is bound to change in many ways throughout its development, just like it did with the version 40 update that came out as I was making this video. Because of this, new information will have to be covered. As well, at least some, if not all of the information in this video will become outdated and need to be updated. But my hope is that this video will be useful for the time being and be a way to look back on what the game was like once it has changed significantly. As always, thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed.